It's February 7, 1914, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Okay, check this out. That extremely funny silence was me imitating Charlie Chaplin's Tramp, the hapless everyman he debuted today in history in 1914 in an odd little short film called Kid Auto Races at Venice. Remarkably, he had invented the soon-to-be-universally-adored character only three days earlier on the set of another film, literally making up the iconic ensemble on the fly as he walked into the wardrobe department. Yeah, so the Tramp character arrived, so the story goes, on a quiet day at Keystone Studios in January 1914, where basically the the studio's boss, Max Sennett, was fretting that the film that they were shooting that day was lacking a few good gags. And so he sent Chaplin, who had just joined the company, to get decked out in, quote, comedy makeup and to return to the set and inject some laughs. And according to Chaplin's now very much quoted recollection of the day, he said, on the way to the wardrobe, I thought I would dress in baggy pants, big shoes, a cane and a derby hat. I wanted everything to be a contradiction. The pants baggy, the coat tight, the hat small and the shoes large. And the moustache was actually added to, to age his 24-year-old face. He was only 24 at this time without masking his expressions because he was a naturally funny human being. Yes, except he had also been by this stage, because he'd been performing since he was a teenager, a very experienced musical comedian. Mm. And so this whole business about, like, I walked into the costume cupboard and suddenly the tramp came to me. It's like, <laughs> well, yes, but you'd also spent years playing inebriates on stage. I mean, there's literally there's a poster of him standing in front of a poster for him on stage saying Charles Chaplin is the inebriate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel like that would have been a universally beloved character in the same way. <laughs> well, I can't imagine the inebriate was that different to the tramp. It's a little bit like when we were talking about minstrelsy and there being stock characters, you know, in American vaudeville. There were stock characters in British music hall, as we've explored many times before. And, you know, looking a bit down and out and wearing black tie to accentuate that contrast is an absolute staple of British music hall, right? So he'd have seen that sort of act loads mm. of times before. What's interesting about the actual costumes that he found in the Keystone costume cupboard that day is the provenance of them. The trousers were actually fatty arbuckles. Like, had been worn by Fatty Arbuckle in other silent movie comedies. Wow. But they just look particularly hilarious on Chaplin because he's such a little bloke. And so you've got this mm. contrast and the whole thing, as you said, is contrast. But for something that was kind of thrown together, it's incredible that he mm. managed in, in that one trip to the costume cupboard to create an iconic look that, like Mickey Mouse, works yeah. in silhouette. Like a character that still the whole world knows. You could see just a sketch of it and say, well, what's interesting is you wouldn't say that's the tramp anymore, would you? You'd say mm. that's Charlie Chaplin. The two things mm. have just become completely linked. Well, and it's all the more remarkable because this was all completely new to Chaplin too. As you mentioned, he was a seasoned musical performer, but a month before this, he had never acted in front of a camera. He got invited to join Keystone Studio because they had just lost their star, Ford Sterling, and Max Sennett remembered that he'd seen an English comedian in a music hall troupe in New York, and he had a telegram sent to the troupe saying, is there a man named Chaffin in your company or something like that? You know, it was still the early days of film and it was all very casual, you know. One of the things that makes this particular film interesting is the fact that it was filmed at an actual event, surrounded by real people, and that was part of the course in those days. There was no concept of a closed set and on-location shooting. Camera crews, in fact, a camera crew was literally just a man with a camera and a director usually, would turn up where they wanted the thing to be set and just start filming, and that does add a bit of life to the short. And also, I think, if you're a non-Chaplin aficionado, it's just really interesting to see a 1914 Los Angeles caught on film. And it's amazing that the kid auto race that he turned up to was a real event. It was this sanctioned 10 mile race in which 14 year old boys piloted homemade one or two cylinder cars, many adapted from motorcycle engines to share in this prize money of 250 bucks, which would be about $6,500 today. So, you know, worth winning. But from, you know, today's perspective of kind of bubble wrap your child and don't let them do anything dangerous, it's kind of inconceivable that you'd allow boys to do this sort of thing. And the joke of the film is basically that Charlie Chaplin, as the tramp, keeps walking walking in front of the action and 
having all sorts of different results. Sometimes it's just sort of humorous in the way that he's mugging to the camera. Sometimes he's walking in front of a camera that's trying to film the race. And sometimes he is actually being accosted yeah. by what looks like and probably was real people from the crowd who are trying to stop him from getting hit by cars and stopping yeah. the action. And therefore actually was genuinely dangerous. I mean, right. you know, he could have hurt himself. What's interesting is because of his training in music hall comedy in the UK, he knew how to fall over and not hurt himself. But still, that doesn't prepare you for being hit from behind at 20 miles an hour, does it? Yeah. Um, I guess it shows in a way that he was brave and that he had balls, but actually also that he was 24 and didn't give a shit. Like there was that yeah, element yeah. of like, I'm just trying this oh, and seeing what happens. Yeah. And therefore having the license to break the fourth wall, look down the barrel of the camera, which is so effective. It's, I mean, it's mm. such a straightforward thing, but hadn't really been done before. This idea that the audience are in on the joke with this guy, that he's representing mm you 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 want him to do something weird because he's doing what you'd do if you were there and I think he only really had the confidence to do that because actually although this was the first film to be released with him as the tramp it was the second one that he'd filmed just through a weird quirk of shooting schedules the day he was in the costume cupboard and he went onto the set was a more traditional Hollywood closed set thing it was a film called Mabel's Strange Predicament. It feels like the most classic title of a silent movie you could possibly have. <laughs> By the way, guys, I checked, and the predicament is that she gets locked out of a hotel room in her pyjamas, leading to comical misunderstandings. Yeah, I mean, the way that he talks about the Tramp character having come to him all at once when he just put on the costume doesn't really tell the full story of those early Keystone one-reelers where the Tramp is just a very different character to the quite adorable adorable one that he ends up later on in his run. He's often meaner and tougher and certainly not a rough sleeper. He often has a job. He can be things like a piano mover or a waiter. Uh, and sometimes he even has a home and a wife and a child. He's this kind of pleasure-seeking, anti-authoritarian uh, character right from the start and a big flirt. You know, he gets a lot of gags from just flirting with women. But he often kind of steals booze, but not because he doesn't have money to pay for it. You know, he's got all of these contradictions that were ironed out as the character continued to live also because of the life that Charlie Chaplin was living himself and the criticism that was coming his way just a bit later in his film career he wanted to make his character as likable as possible you kind of end up with a tramp that is quite different from the one that starts at the beginning well it's a real Hollywood story isn't it Charlie Chaplin it is a rags to riches story he was born in London in 1889. He had a tough workhouse childhood, an absent father. His mother was in an asylum. He left school at 13. So his whole motivation, really, of travelling to the US was to make money and was to ensure that he would never be poor again. And so there's this lifestyle that he then genuinely, as Charlie Chaplin leads, which is all Hollywood mansions and being adored, whilst at the same time knowing that he's the working class kid from England, it all happened so quickly for him. And at any moment in his mind, he could go back to this world of illness and crushing poverty. And I suppose that's what you see in the character. Um, I mean, here's Chaplin himself describing him in his autobiography. The Tramp is a gentleman, a poet, a dreamer, a lonely fellow, always hopeful of romance and adventure. He would have you believe he is a scientist, a musician, a duke, a polo player. However, he's not above picking up cigarette butts or robbing a baby of its candy. And of course, <laughs> if the occasion warrants it, he will kick a lady in the rear but only in extreme <laughs> anger. <laughs> <laughs> and in this short, you can see the seeds of what would make Chaplin one of the most famous men in the world. You know, there's a, the physical humour and also the fact that this was comedy that could be understood by people all over the world. Obviously, this was before the advent of sound, so language barriers weren't a problem really at this point. But also the fact that the humour didn't require any kind of cultural context. It was really easy to understand what the joke was because there really was only one joke. And in fact, the magazine, The Cinema, called... Kid Auto Races at Venice, which is six minutes of two men jostling about the funniest film we have ever seen. I mean, in fairness, it was 1914. They probably weren't wrong. I mean, there is a slightly more sophisticated level of humour happening. You know, the way the film is framed like a real newsreel. It's parodying the format. You know, you see the camera and the camera crew shooting, which must have seemed like a really exciting break of the fourth wall. But oddly, 
when it was released. It was released as a two-part reel paired with an educational film called Olives and Their Oil. So if you sat through <laughs> Olives and Their Oil, you were probably ready for a laugh. <laughs> so the arrival of sound was a problem because not only was the silent comedy style quickly seeming outdated, the, but dialogue struck at the quintessential appeal of the trap, you know, that mournful silent face paired with the slapstick antics. And Chaplin ultimately retired the character in the film Modern Times, released in 1936, which had a pretty on-the-nose plot, which follows the tramp as a laid-off factory worker oh, who's so unable good, to though. contend with it? a fast-paced... Yeah, no, so I have good. not. It's I genuinely it. funny. I mean, it's laugh out yeah. loud funny. <laughs> you know, and it's sort of kind of... It seemed, I mean, I'm not going to tell you what it does because I haven't seen it and you have, <laughs> but it seems like it was a way of kind of wrapping up that tramp character. Yeah. And that was sort of his swan song. And then Chaplin moved into playing non-tramp roles for the rest of his career. Well, the problem is, of course, he had actually quite a clipped British accent and he didn't want to compromise on the essential, the quintessential Americanness of the tramp as a character. Everyone saw it as an American icon. People weren't even aware he was British. In truth, what happened is uh, because of rumours of his communism, he was chased out of Hollywood. He became a fugitive, effectively, from J. Edgar Hoover. And after making some pretty amazing films, went and lived in Switzerland for decades until he got an honorary Oscar in the 1970s towards the end of his life. And it remains, I think, the longest ever standing ovation at the Academy Awards. It's something like 11 wow. minutes, which went out live on TV, <laughs> of people just standing and clapping and cheering and being caught up with the emotion. Twice the length of this film. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Tomorrow. It's interesting, in the early 60s already, people were thinking, this could be the end of people carrying cash. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors patreon.com slash retrospectors